Thanks, thanks for, for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I work with an organization called Night Mozilla Open News. Uh, have some swag on the table if anyone wants to, wants to come get some after the talk. Uh, and we exist to support the community around code in journalism. So I was excited to share some of the lessons we've learned, um, talk about some of the leaders in this community, how they got connected with the journalism code community, and also pose some questions to the open source community as well. Um, okay. So the navel gazing piece of it is uh, there's been a lot of navel gazing about the end of newspapers. Things are terrible. This is a chart of newspaper jobs from 2013 to 2012. And in 10 years, newsrooms lost 16,000 jobs. That's a lot of jobs. It, there, there really has been a crisis and a lot of change happening in journalism in the US and also internationally. That's caused a lot of people to, to worry. Uh, but it's a problem that's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, just doing a Google search for future of journalism is literally 60 million results. <laughs> So we've spent a lot of time looking at what's going on in journalism, trying to think about what might the future of journalism be? Uh, what, what are we concerned about with the changes in, in journalism? There's, there's websites, there's studies, there's academic institutions, there's endless Twitter battles. There's lots of discussion happening about the future of journalism. And uh, one example of that was last month, this uh, innovation report from the New York Times was leaked. Uh, and it was a report where they were looking at ways that they could be more innovative and how to use technology in their newsroom. And to me, what was really interesting about this report was that the New York Times is an institution with nearly unparalleled resources. Like they have staff and funding that other organizations would dream and die for. And uh, they still have a, a lot of issues with uh, engaging journalism and technology. And, um, and so it was, it was an interesting example of like, even they don't have it all figured out. <laughs> um, but they, they have been doing a lot of amazing work in all different areas of journalism code. Um, so one piece of that is just simply journalism code. What, what are we talking about if we're talking about journalism code? One example is Document Cloud, which is a project that started at the New York Times. Uh, it's a project to help journalists uh, gather and annotate PDFs. It's really a kind of internal tool that can then be displayed back to the user. Uh, but in addition to being a tool for um, helping journalists and uh, helping share information from PDFs, it's also where Backbone and Underscore were developed out of, which are JavaScript libraries that now power many things around the web beyond journalism. Um, and they got their start at this project at the, at the New York Times to help journalists better engage with documents and readers better understand those documents. Uh, there's also a long history with open source. Uh, so Django is another project that started in a newsroom in the middle of nowhere, USA, in Kansas. Um, so a very different situation from, uh, from the New York Times. Um, but as the, uh, as the subhead says, it's the web framework for perfectionists with deadlines. Um, it was developed in the newsroom, and the kind of uh, unforgiving newsroom deadlines uh, helped them build something that's gone on to be used by a wide range of other sites and platforms on, on the web. Um, so in addition to things that are kind of behind the scenes for journalism code, there's also journalism code that you can see. So this is an example. We uh, organized a hack day this past weekend. This is one of the projects from that, that hack day. It's a map of disputed territories. So what, it, what this project did was looked at different disputed territories around the world and then showed what the Google Maps view would be from different countries. And so you could see the difference between here, what US Google Maps users see, what users in China see, and users in India see from this disputed area. And it changes depending on where you would be browsing from. Um, so a lot of journalism code projects are also along these lines where it's visualizing information in a different way or gathering data to help, uh, help share it in, in a different way. So there's lots of ways that code is related to work that we see in journalism and that powers the rest of the web. So how do we get nerds into the newsroom? How, how are our coders getting invited? So 
One of the uh, ways for a long time has been the Knight News Challenge. The Knight News Challenge is a grant program that the Knight Foundation has done for many years. It actually funded the development of Document Cloud, continues to fund Document Cloud, uh, and was very project focused. Um, as is common with, with foundation funded projects, um, it was focused on particular tools, particular teams um, that may have been within a news organization, maybe not. Um, Knight also saw fit to uh, create our organization, Knight Mozilla Open News, and our organization was created uh, more to focus on the community side of things. And uh, initially, the, the project, which started out as the Knight Mozilla News Technology Partnership, if you encountered that jumble of words a couple of years ago, was very focused on uh, bringing individuals into the newsroom, but Open News has since brought in to be more focused on the, the full community. And so that's where this little photo of a ladder, which I liked that it was also a ladder on a bike, which seemed very appropriate for Portland. Um, it's really, uh, we found about creating ladders of engagement where people are able to connect wherever they are in terms of their pathway with journalism, with coding, um, with journalism and coding, and move up in uh, their leadership role in, their com in the community, build their skills. Uh, and, and so that's where we've really begun to focus the work in open news and where we've seen other communities have, have a lot of success in, in this area. So we, we support that work in, in a few different ways. So one of those ways is through supporting hack events. This is a photo from a hack day in Chicago last year. Um, we, we realized we needed to find ways to help people connect in their own communities where they were already working, um, as well as to share information with colleagues on the web, uh, which led to us developing a website called Source, um, and to a variety of other types of, types of partnerships that I'll go into in a little bit more detail uh, in a bit. Um, so in terms of connecting in, in local communities, that was definitely uh, my personal experience. So I'm from Philadelphia. I found some little Philly icons. Uh -huh. My uh, entry into, into programming and open source was through Drupal. Uh, I saw this great quote on on Twitter a couple of months ago about uh, content management systems being a gateway drug to programming. And that was definitely my experience. Uh, and, and it was my gateway into programming, but also into the open source community, where in Philly there is a very robust Drupal community. And from there, uh, I was able to combine my interests in journalism and technology. And, is, and I am one of the co-founders of the Hacks Hackers chapter in Philadelphia. Um, Hacks Hackers, there's a Hacks Hackers Portland, is an organization where there are uh, grassroots chapters around the world of hacks, a uh, term some people still use for journalists, hackers, techies. Um, there's a little bit of dispute about creating a dividing line between the two, uh, but I think it's mostly just kind of a fun name at this point. Um, so, so there are chapters all around the world of journalists and techies who come together uh, for events and uh, learning and that sort of thing. Um, in, in Philly, we've also been tremendously lucky to have a really robust uh, civic hacking community as well. Um, and there's been a lot of overlap between civic hacking and journalism. Um, a, lot of, a lot of that because we've definitely seen that people who have an idea of wanting to do good with programming skills uh, find a lot of different ways to do that. And civic hacking has definitely been a major way of doing that. Uh, recently and uh, journalism is also a growing a growing way of doing that um, so with our uh, support of hack days it's actually around the world uh, this is a map of some of the the hack days that that we've supported um, there's definitely concentrations of of events and portions of the map that we still haven't haven't reached but we're able to to reach out to folks uh, in communities that are already engaging with, uh, with journalists and developers and want to hold an event to bring people together, to spend a day, spend a weekend hacking together, building together, building connections with each other. Um, so the way that we, we help out these events is we support with funding, with money, and with organizing support. Uh, I put together a guide to hosting journo hack days. Uh, 
on, on GitHub with just some tips of things that, that we've learned. And some of the, some of the, the key things that we've learned are um, to just set clear goals for an event uh, and to do what you need to do to meet them. One of the things that uh, was really powerful to me when I was working on that documentation was how often my comments just kept coming back to, and do what you know you should do. Trust yourself. Do what your community would want you to do. Uh, I think a lot of times people can get wrapped up in like, what's the best way to do the thing? Or what's the best way to organize the event? And a lot of that comes, we, uh, we've seen, from what people know from their communities. It's not something that we can like dictate, uh, you must serve pizza or you must serve coffee, because that's not going to be relevant in every, in every community. Uh, and then the, the final piece that we found to be really important is reporting back and, and reconnecting that work. And that's been one of the really cool things to see uh, organizers across the globe, across the country, uh, who have organized similar events, uh, give each other advice, learn from each other, be able to build on each other's lessons because they took the time to uh, document, document their work. Um, another key way that, that folks connect is through our website source. Uh, source is the online home for the work that Open News does. It, uh, the tagline is journalism code and the people who make it. It's a place where people share explainers about projects that they've worked on, share code repos, share in-depth explainers about uh, case studies and different aspects of what it means to work in, in journalism code. And Source serves a, a few different roles. Um, one thing is that it is on its own kind of a leadership building mechanism in terms of helping people uh, along with writing and documenting their work, with telling a story about their work, with seeing their byline on a site outside of their news organization or some news organizations um, uh, don't always byline their devs, so it might be seeing a byline at all. Um, but also, it's been a really tremendous resource in terms of connecting new folks who aren't already working in a news organization but might be curious about different aspects of journalism code or might want to find a tool like Backbone or Underscore uh, because a lot of tools that uh, folks have used for newsrooms are also relevant outside of newsrooms and uh, Source is a place to learn a little bit more about how to use those tools and, and engage with them. Um, so one, one cool example there is, uh, this is Chris Keller. I wanted to introduce you to some of the leaders in the journalism code community. So Chris Keller is a news developer at KPCC, the uh, public radio station in Los Angeles. And uh, his background is as a journalist. And so he's self-taught the development side of his work. And he's done a phenomenal job continuing to document this work. So this is a piece that he wrote for Source about um, uh, they, they built this fire tracker app for fires in, in California, and they were refactoring it for the next year. And uh, he talked about the, the process, the learning process of refactoring it. Um, it runs on, on Google Docs, so learning about how, uh, how they set things up with that, as well as um, the like Python and Django skills he, he was building in, in terms of being able to work with the data a little bit more easily. Um, so that's, that's, that's one example of many on, on source, but uh, an example of someone who came from within journalism and is like developing leadership um, on the development side of things. So another phenomenal example um, in terms of building connections is through hosting the, the hack events that I mentioned earlier. So this is a chart of the, um, the growth of the Hacks Hackers Buenos Aires meetup community to a certain point. I couldn't, I couldn't find the updated version. But it is now one of the largest uh, Hacks Hackers chapters in the world. I think there are over 3,000 members at this point. Uh, and there's a related chart that's just phenomenal uh, showing the, the different events that punctuated that growth and, and the growth that was happening in the community led by Mariano Blushman, just this amazing, uh, 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 amazing community builder in, in Buenos Aires. And uh, it's, it's been really, really great to see how, how they've grown, grown that community. And part of how they've grown that community is by building a pipeline of involvement. 
Um, so they have, they started with local events, local hack days. They now have an international media party. That's the photo from the media party in 2013. People from all over the world raising their hands. <laughs> it's very joyous events. Um, so it's become a place where people get together in internationally. Um, Hacks Labs, they're starting a small um, grant project to help fund projects that get their start at a hackathon, but need some support to like keep moving after the hackathon, which is often an issue with, um, with hackathon projects just kind of dying after, after an event. Um, one, of the, one of the projects that grew from one of their hackathons that's been a, become a tremendous community resource is this tool called Hackdash, which is a really phenomenal resource for tracking uh, projects during a hackathon. And it's an active de development. We've used it for events. We've given them uh, feedback that's been pulled into the, into the development of the tool. Um, and so it's been a really cool example of a tool that has grown from that community but has supported the work in a lot of other communities as well. Um, and then another really fantastic story from uh, Buenos Aires is uh, Marcos Veneta, he is one of the Knight Mozilla Fellows this year, and he is a member of the Buenos Aires community, is an example of someone who started getting engaged, uh, started working on a project, started working on the project full time, <laughs> applied to the fellowship, and is now working at the Texas Tribune, a small nonprofit news organization. Uh, uh, full-time as, as a fellow, he previously hadn't been connected with journalism, but got his start through, through this community and is now doing this work full-time. Um, and he just spoke at a conference in Barcelona about the uh, project that, that he was working on from Hacksackers Buenos Aires. And um, it's been a really, really uh, amazing, amazing pathway because there are people in this community who help keep um, connecting the dots and pushing people up a, up a ladder of engagement. Um, so uh, another way for, for people to build connections is through building and connecting with open source projects. Uh, so um, Alan is a dev at MinPost, another nonprofit news organization. He put together this website, Journalism and Code. It's just an easily sortable site of uh, GitHub repos of different uh, journalism code projects from uh, an array of news organizations. Um, he's, he's also a really cool uh, story. He is a Code for America alum, uh, very active in the Drupal community, and now he works full time as a news developer um, and is very active in the community creating tools like this, speaking at conferences. Um, he's always in our IRC channel answering questions and um, that sort of thing. So uh, this, this site gives you a link to a lot of different journalism code projects. Uh, I just want to call out one in particular that is kind of my um, very favorite project. Uh, not that I have favorites, but um, it's one that I really, really am excited about. OK. So this project is called Free the Files. It was created by ProPublica during the 2012 presidential election um, to access FCC data. Um, so a lot of FCC data is, is easily accessible, but some of it is trapped in PDFs that come from individual news, uh, news channels where uh, campaigns would make ad buys. So campaigns make, make ad buys and you want to know who was buying the ad and, and some other information, but there's no standardized uh, um, uh, document for these invoices. Uh, and they come from all over the country, and so they just had a mess of impenetrable PDFs. And uh, they decided they wanted to try to get the information out of those PDFs. So they set up this tool where uh, it asked a couple of different questions of the key pieces of information that they wanted to have out of the document. Um, and human beings entered that information since it wasn't easily uh, uh, an, an easy task for a computer, and then um, the answers from humans were compared to one another to, to find out what was a reliable answer. Um, so so they, they referred to this as a casino-driven development, which, uh, feelings about casinos aside, is to indicate that it was fun. <laughs> it, was, it was actually, I did it. I thought it was really fun. Um, they, they had a leaderboard of who reviewed the most files, and the top person reviewed almost 33,000 files. Uh, it was just the kind of thing where 
if you had some time that you didn't really have anything to do with, you could just like click through. Um, they organized the files by different, uh, different geographic regions that had competitive races in 2012. So you could also say, you know, I really care about what's happening in this region. I'm only going to review files there and really want to make sure that we have the data so I know how the money is being spent in my area. Or if your area wasn't a competitive race, like another area that you cared about. And it was, it was legit fun. It was just like you, you clicked, you added a few things, you clicked. And I mean, this top 10, everyone reviewed more than 1,000 files. Uh, and then this, this leaderboard also shows um, the ad buys by market and the, the top ad buyers. So it was also tracking the regions and the, um, the campaigns or the, the political action committees that were, that were making the buys. Um, so, so they were able to create this pretty simple way to get people to engage with the project, to get data that they were then able to actually report with when otherwise it would have been like a total slog. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting way of, of engaging the community that way. Um, but then they also went and open sourced the project that uh, under, underlied the whole thing. So it was renamed as Transcribable. Uh, Al Shaw is the dev at ProPublica who um, open, open sourced the project. And uh, it's on GitHub and um, it took about a week for him to, to spend the time to like really get it to a place where it could be shared and usable for other people. Um, but they put that time in to uh, like authentically open source it, make it, make it use, reusable by other folks. And, uh, and it got reused, <laughs> which was also a really exciting uh, example of um, community connection by uh, La Nacion uh, news organization in, in Argentina. They, they also have like their leaderboard there and um, they, they were able to find out about spending in, in the Senate there about $55,000 of, of spending. Um, and then they, the team at La Nacion also paid it forward and uh, open sourced the, the version of Transcribable that they were working on. Uh, the team behind this was um, Manuela Ristoran, who was a Knight Mozilla Fellow with La Nacion in 2013, and Gabriela Rodriguez, uh, who is our Knight Mozilla Fellow at La Nacion right now, who's also from Portland. I don't know if anyone may know her. Um, but uh, it was a cool project where they were able to, even after Manuel finished his fellowship, she was able to continue with the work. And, uh, and now it's, it's open sourced and available for another news organization to, to, to use. And, um, and they've been sharing the information about the project uh, with, with community members informally as well. Um, so those are, those are some of the ways that people like, deepen, deepen their engagement in the community and, and build leadership on projects they're already working on or uh, topics that are really exciting to them. Uh, and then the, the final piece of the building the leadership ladder is definitely the leading piece. And so a really cool example of this is uh, CC Way, who is a dev at ProPublica, and Tom, who is at the New York Times, and they uh, did Code With Me, which was in Portland about a year ago. I don't know if anyone caught that, but Code With Me is a program to help journalists build uh, some basic programming skills through a mentorship model and uh, um, and like a, an intensive weekend introduction. So uh, they are uh, kind of the the next generation of newsroom coders, people who studied uh, journalism and computer science and did internships while they were in college. It's something that they've they've kind of been doing their entire academic into uh, into professional career. And so they're at the point where they're sharing sharing things back, where they're creating their own initiatives, like really, really taking on a leadership role in in the community. Uh, and one way that that we have the kind of top tier of building a uh, leadership role in the open news community is through our, our fellowship program. Uh, so these are our current fellows, our 2014 Knight Mozilla Fellows. They are at news organizations. Um, uh, Brian Jacobs on the far left is at ProPublica. Aurelia Mosier is uh, in a combination with Ushahidi and Internews Kenya. Um, 
Ga Gabriela is at La Nacion, Marcos is at Texas Tribune, Harlow is at New York Times, and Ben is at the Washington Post. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, in, in the original conception of, uh, of the Open News Project, the Knight Mozilla News Technology Partnership, it was very focused on the fellowship as kind of the, the, key, the key piece of things. Um, and, and it remains a way to really help a select number of people become leaders in the community, deepen, deepen their skills, deepen their involvement, um, and, and draw attention to, to the work that they're doing. Um, something that's interesting with the fellows this year is none of them had connections to journalism prior to the fellowship, um, which the prior year is about half and half. Uh, but this year, it's, it's all new people bringing outside perspectives in into journalism, and so we've we've put a lot of attention into the fellowship, and we've learned some lessons that are applicable beyond just uh, these these six people at a time. Um, so so some of those some of those lessons. This is a new map. <laughs> it's a map of the applicants to the 2014 fellowship. Um, so the the applicants were actually a little bit more evenly distributed than our, our hack days have been. Um, in, uh, in 2014, it was the, the third year of our application process. Uh, from 2013 to, 20, to the 2013 to the 2014 process, we had a 62% increase in applicants. Um, we also had, a, we went from about 5% of applicants being women to about 20% of applicants being women. Um, and uh, interestingly, with, with, with this growth, the, um, the geographic distribution either uh, increased or remained, remained about the same. Um, Argentina, for us, has been a kind of a hotbed of, of interest, uh, as was demonstrated by the fantastic community in, in Buenos Aires. Um, there's, there's also been a lot of interest from, from India, I think reflective of the, the networks that Mozilla continues to have in, in India. Um, and one interesting tit tidbit with the uh, fellowship search last year was um, the applicants from, from Germany. Uh, in Germany, we had two news partners in 2013, and this year we don't have any news partners in 2013, but we got more applicants from Germany uh, for this year than we did for the, for the prior year. And, uh, and I think what that really points to uh, is that it's really, it's really about relationships. Um, so I thought I was trying to find relationship photos and like don't do that search on Flickr, it's really weird. Um, so then I was trying to think like what's related to relationships and what's really related to relationships for me is, um, is being rooted in organizing. And so I thought this was like a really great uh, kind of uh, thought to have. Life's more fun when you're organized. I guess it depends on what purpose you're organized for. And I don't know that I would really want to be in plastic boxes like that, but I, I appreciated the sentiment. Uh, but I think what we really found uh, with the relationship building was Germany was just such a fascinating example because our two fellows in Germany in uh, 2013, when we were doing the search for this year, uh, Annabelle and Friedrich were very active in that community. Annabelle became one of the organizers of the Hacks Hackers Berlin chapter. Many of our uh, applications from that region specifically said that Friedrich or Annabelle told them to apply. It was very clear that like, the relationships that they, that they built throughout that time in Germany uh, really resulted in people, in people then feeling able to apply to, to the fellowship. Um, and that has also been, as I mentioned, the experience in Buenos Aires. Um, and it's, it's been the experience that, that I've had in terms of doing outreach to folks. Like when I've tried to do personal outreach to people, people who I already had a relationship with, I got far more traction with than people who I was doing a cold email of, hey, maybe you want to tell people about this fellowship thing. Um, and so it's just been really, really amazing how uh, like basic concepts of, of being, of organizing people, of making connections with people are really important. Um, and that's been a, a tremendous thing that's been consistent in, in all areas of my life personally, like doing political organizing, doing social justice work, and then somehow also in journalism and technology, which I wouldn't necessarily have, have expected. Um, 
So one, one other thing we found in, in doing this outreach is to be specific. Um, who? Tell people who you would like to, to have apply. Um, we, we were specific that we were asking for recommendations in particular for women and other people underrepresented in technology uh, just to really give another, um, give another cue to people to, to think a little harder about maybe not just like the usual suspects list of people. Um, and we also uh, like tuned our outreach to different communities so the type of outreach we would do with an open source community would be very different than the outreach at a journalism community or um, a, a different group like that. Um, so one, one other key piece of what we learned is you need to ask a lot and then ask people again. Um, so uh, I got this piece of advice from Nicole Knoll, who is one of the founders of the Women's Coding Collective. Uh, she, she gave me this tip off of ideas from like she should run. It's a similar concept in uh, encouraging women to run for office that you need to ask women seven or eight times uh, that they should run for office uh, before they'll like really start thinking about it. And, and so we, we kept that in mind. We put like small asks throughout our copy on our website. Um, in, in emails would just encourage people with apply, apply now. Uh, just small ways of, of reminding people you should apply, making that ask uh, in different ways. One of, one of the suggestions she had that we, that we didn't get to, to put into place um, is also the idea of doing uh, like quiz or survey. Um, like, uh, am I a good, uh, good potential applicant for the fellowship and like walking someone through some questions and like each question then being another opportunity to reiterate, yes, you should apply, yes, you should apply. Um, so, so that was definitely uh, a bit of advice that, that, was really, that was really helpful for us. Um, and I think like one of the, one of the big lessons that, that I learned from the, from the fellowship outreach that we did is that uh, it's definitely relevant to things like conferences. That's actually where a lot of the tips uh, were derived from were, were ideas about ensuring a uh, diverse array of speakers at conferences. And so we are putting our own conference on in July. It happens to be in, in Philly. I actually didn't lobby for it, even though it would be very nice to be in Philly. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, we got this like just fantastic message from uh, one of the people who's going to be speaking at, at the conference, thanking, thanking us for doing, the, doing work to, um, to create a diverse con conference, doing outreach. And, and that's, been, that's been one of the really, really big lessons is uh, we, did, we did some of this proactive work for the fellowship, and it seems like it gained traction. But uh, it's definitely not been the kind of thing we're like, oh, we got to figure it out. We can stop now. We don't have to like ask anybody again. Um, I mean, one one thing, say from our experience with the with the conference this year, is uh, we had an open call for session proposals, and uh, I think about a week in, the only session proposals we had from women were our fellows, and it's like, okay. That's good that our fellows <laughs> pitch session proposals, but like clearly that is not the end of where our, our outreach and our work needs needs to be. And um, and we definitely redoubled our, our outreach efforts at that point. Um, and I and I think that was just a really really important lesson to me is just that like it's it's ongoing work, like with relationship building, like being conscious of the kinds of um, connections you're making and the kinds of people you're supporting is something that just never, never stops. Um, so I, I wanted to bring some questions to you all uh, that we could talk about now or uh, talk about after the, the talk. But um, there's a lot of overlap between open source communities and journalism tech communities. There's overlap, obviously, in terms of the journalism institutions are creating open source software. Um, but I think that there's a lot that we could be, be learning from, e from each other. Uh, I mean, there's going to be a session from Open Hatch about like really great ways of getting people like actually contributing to open source software. And I think there's things we can learn from that. I think yesterday there was a session about uh, um, Google's program for, for engaging women. There's a lot of there's a lot of great projects out there, um, and I know there's a lot we can learn from each other. And that definitely led me to the uh, like final question of like, since we have a lot to learn from each other, 
how do we support each other in actually enacting the lessons that, that we learn from, from our communities. Um, oh, it's cool. No, I, it's totally fine. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if we want to open it up for a little bit of a discussion now. We do have like a decent chunk of time. Um, so I don't know if any of these questions speak to you or if from what I was talking about, if there were any questions you wanted to um, shoot my way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's like a fascinating area of, of discussion. I think one of, the, one of the really great ways to get at that question is through hack days. And that's something that I've seen when hack days work really well is part of the experience is figuring out the answer to that question. Is like as teams take shape and take different roles in a project, people learn what it means to be part of a news process from the journalists in the group and from a development process from the developers in the group. And it's information that they can take back to their work after the hack day, even if the project that they work on doesn't, doesn't continue. Um, so I think that like that can be a really great learning experience. For a uh, um, specific example, uh, one of the other projects from this hack day that we did last, last weekend was uh, this project called Squishify. And it was a team that took the, uh, the FCC proposal about net neutrality and squishified it and uh, took uh, each paragraph and tried to distill it to a sentence that a human could read. And uh, they, they did that by uh, using journalists. And so like half of their team was journalists who did the summarization, like did the actual reporting piece of it. And then the developers on the team built the display, built how, how uh, users could like actually engage with the, with the display. Um, and so like it was definitely a team where in every, in every example that I've, I've seen them speak about it, they, they referenced that division of labor and how they learned about that division of labor um, through, through, their, through their process. I think in terms of how it works in news organizations, it varies a lot um, depending on how embedded the news organization or the, the news development team is in the newsroom, how embedded they are on a particular project. Um, that was a question that was uh, delved into in a lot of detail in that New York Times report. Um, it also varies, uh, say, if there's like one dev at a news organization kind of doing it all versus if there are actually teams with people playing different roles. Um, but it's, 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 a really, it's a really interesting area in terms of um, how, how journalists and developers uh, in, inform and teach each other about, uh, about how they approach projects. Like it, it's, it's definitely an ongoing area of people trying different ways of, of setting up teams. Any other questions or fantastic answers to my questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's definitely like a, a number of different levels to that answer. Um, 
So, I mean, there, there's the level of uh, computer-assisted reporting. So computer-assisted reporting is an old term for uh, using technology in, in news organizations. And there, the annual conference that's kind of like the hub for the journalism code community uh, is NICAR, which is the National Institute for Computer-Assisted Reporting Conference. Um, and so like that is old school like FOIA requests and diving into data and stuff that people have done for decades. And so that's definitely one part of uh, FOIA requests, sorry, are Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, people, people have processes that work there. There are new tools being developed to like make it easier, but like people know how to do data journalism and they've done it for decades and they're continuing to teach each other how to do it. And then on like the other side of the spectrum might be like machine learning and, and people who, who are building algorithms to help look through campaign finance data, for example. And there's a piece on Source about a reporter who is, who is working on that. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff in the middle and a lot of the, the kinds of code repos that are on source and, and on GitHub from news organizations are tools to like make it easier to handle data or to, to investigate or interrogate data. Um, and who uses those kind of varies depending on their skill sets, but there's definitely this like wide spectrum of ways that people can, can investigate data. I mean, I would say that that's also um, one, of the, uh, one of the really great things about um, our website source. Um, not to uh, uh, toot our own horn too much, but uh, journalists who have been doing this work for decades or many, many years have a lot of great uh, skills and knowledge about dealing with data. And there's a section on source uh, learning section where people dive deep into different aspects of journalism, such as like data handling, data cleaning, and projects that they've worked on in journalism, but it's totally relevant outside of that as well. Um, and there's areas of say like journalism ethics that I read a, a, a piece and I'm like, if I had that at a hackathon two weeks ago where it was all civic hackers and there are no journalists in the room, things that could have gone very differently in terms of considering things that aren't first to mind for people who aren't journalists. Um, so I think there's a lot of a uh, of, uh, of, of place where people are sharing lo those learnings and um, and trying to, to push that out just beyond um, just beyond a, a particular story or developing a particular story um, so I think uh, it's getting near wrap-up time so I'll just like run through the get in touch real real fast so if the hack days and event stuff uh, piqued your interest you can totally contact me I love helping organize those things. We're also moving into more uh, like learning oriented events, not just uh, solely hack day events. So definitely email me if you want to talk more about that. I mentioned source. Um, if uh, this whole tale of building leadership in the journalism code community interests you, you could join a newsroom. And in fact, I saw at least three job postings on Twitter today. Um, it was, I don't know what's happening, but all over the country, everyone appears to be hiring this week. And uh, on our site source, there's a section of job listings, which is one place to find a, a curated list of those jobs. Um, and uh, if, if you're not quite ready to join a newsroom, but want to learn more about what this whole world is about, um, you should definitely think about applying to our fellowship. The application is open now. It's open till August 16th. I'm so excited to talk to anybody about it. Uh, so it's a really great program. And it's also become a way where um, when people apply, uh, last year we had just these so many phenomenal applicants and we could only take six people. And it's like, wow. But now we have this group of people who have like raised their hand and said, I'm excited about this stuff. I want to engage more. And uh, we've been able to like push people towards job opportunities, towards writing about things, towards uh, conferences and other opportunities. And we're really excited about engaging people um, as fellows, but also as the fellowship process being uh, part of it. So um, let's work together. Uh, thank you.